but also the peace poets to lead us in a little bit of spoken word and a little bit of music before we get started for our final session. So go ahead and welcome with me the peace poets. It's, hello, okay, here we go. If you didn't hear it, then please welcome our good brothers, the peace poets. Let's hear it. I wanna, I wanna ask I want to ask people to uh, have a seat. My check, my check. We're going to do a song together. They're going to, the Peace Poets will lead us in this song together. And what we want to, uh, as people trickle in, we want them to understand that the session has begun. We're, this is not background music, folks. This is not chit chat music. I want to ask your uh, complete attention to our good brothers, peace poets. Folks, if you could let your neighbors know this is not background music. People giving their lives doing this music. Uh, this is not elevator music for people to chit chat. It's, uh, it's an essential part of the workshop of the, of the conference. Learning songs that will help you when you're in the midst of struggle when you're in the midst of desperation because things look hard, these are the songs that will help you ignite and inspire your partners when you're facing very difficult moments. So I know people are trickling in. If you're attentive with us, they'll get the message that this is not a time to chit chat. It's a time to sit down because they're already late, okay? Organizing folks. Here we go. All right, my people, so we're going to invite you to sing this song with us. It's called Never Alone, and the words go like this. If you could repeat after me. Just real quick, if the, we could turn this monitor down a little bit, that'd be good. We're getting some feedback. There we go, there we go. Thank you. All I right. A little bit more is all right. Right here is probably good. Thank you. It's, uh, shout out to all the tech folks in the back. Gratitude. Yeah. All, right. all right. Yeah, man. Yeah, round of applause. Tech so folks and workers too. Making this happen. That's right. All right, my people. It goes like this. I have not come here alone. I have not come here alone. I carry my people in my bones. I carry my people in my bones. I have not come here alone. I have not come here alone. And if you listen, you can hear them in my soul. And if you listen, you can hear them in my soul. Easy. I already know the lyrics. We invite you to sing with us. So rock with us as we do this, y'all. If you wanna, if you feel like putting your hands together, honestly, if you feel like getting up and dancing, that's right. Go ahead, feel free, all right? Here we go. Oh. Yes, yes. So I have not come here alone. I carry my people in my bones. Yes, I have not come here alone. And if you listen, you can hear them in my soul. Cause I have not come here alone. All right. I carry my people in my bones. Sing, I have not. I have not come here alone. And if you listen, you can hear them in my soul. Let's go. Yes. Uh, I'm not alone like our people at a graduation They call your name, you hear the photo, it's a celebration Rooted in culture, traditions of libations Stolen black gold, spread, spread through many nations. nations So many iterations, we are the variations But at large, we don't understand the situation Love is simple, but we're caught up in the complications yes. I am not alone, I feel myself in your vibration Showing up loud with my grandmother's voice Coming through calm with my old man's poise In case you're wondering who making all the noise I'm coming with the hood and talking against toy I'm from a long line of active east sides Breaking down the borders of Bidia Lisa We don't die, we multiply We a million more times than me, sir I have nothing that come here alone See, I carry my people I carry my people in my bones That's right, that's right I have not come here alone and if you listen, you can hear them in my soul. Oh, yes, go. yes. 
I sit back and reflect on Che Guevara, Malcolm Martin, and Freddie D. U. E. P. and Asada. Nelson G's and Muhammad Ghani and soldier in the truth. All the mamas and the papas out here steady raising our youth. Plant seeds, cause you know of our roots. With our hands in the land till we burn this fruit. I thought Bay calling out, telling us we were robbed. Look deep in your eyes and realize I have not Let's go. come here alone. Let me hear come on, come on. I carry my people in my bones. That's right, that's right. I have not come here alone. And if you listen, you can hear them in we my do it soul. One more time. Let's hear y'all. I have not come here alone. Yes, bring, bring yes. Your people. I carry my people in my bones. Feel that's how right, that's that right. Is. I have not come here alone. And if you listen, you can hear them in my soul. Say that last listen, line. If you listen, you can hear them in my soul. One more time. If you listen, you, you can, can hear them in my soul. All right, my people, how'd that feel? Yes. Thank y'all for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, part of our work is uh, doing creative writing workshops and one of those creative writing workshops is centered around destigmatizing mental health uh, and mental wellness conversations. Do we have any writers in the room? Any artists, any singers? Raise your hand high. Any, yeah, oh wow. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. We've heard from so many folks sharing their story. It takes so much courage to tell your story, to stand up in a room full of people. It takes courage to be at around a dinner table, expressing your heart, expressing your ideas. And so, this piece right here is dedicated to those moments that we might not feel like enough. That depression might not let us get out of bed. This piece is dedicated to all you creators out there. This is for you. I'd like to think that everything is possible, that nothing is an obstacle, that optimism's optimal, but pessimism never lets you listen to the God in you. Possibility is so strange and seems so odd to you when the machina done got to you. Selling all their visions on the television, opting you to listen to your insecurities while their modules placing all that sickness and disease up inside of you. But it's never to provide for you. It's always just to bottle you, consuming all the products. Who really gets the benefit? Who really makes the sense of it? Let's really get a sense of it and feel it in your body, son. You are full of love and light. Spit that truth in body, son. Because cynicism consuming all of the human in them. We stay a prison reflecting all the lumens in them. Aimed at a system that has us down on our luck. But we're in love with our people. And that's word to this luminous flux. This ain't a mic. This the way you amplify light. So we can see our own reflections in the words that you write. And this ain't a pen. This the way you channel your zen. And meditate upon the days that you were blessed to have been. And this ain't a rap. It's a prayer call to the fact that we're bigger than our fears and the societal traps. On top of that, the world is waiting for you in this hour to realize what you are worth and quickly step into your power. It's not just about your past. We need you more than ever to forgive all of the parts of you you thought were broke and weathered, to give some of that heart that you might think just won't belong because you're too focused on your flaws and everything that you've done wrong, but we need your song. Just look around into the sea of people. It's a celebration. Bunch of spirits bathed in starlight, 
on a quest for liberation. Ancestors in your sister, see them in your brother's eyes. New dawn a day upon us, and all we have to do is rise. And the divine gave you this breath to speak and call your truth to power. In the face of all injustice and a darkness that devours. In the face of crooked cops and a violence that's systemic. It's our fate to sing our song upon this silence epidemic. And you ain't alone. Let's take this time to welcome you home. To a movement born of movements within a dance of our own. Be buoyant through revolution. Be girding through liberation. Up rocking to the solution. Pop lock into occupation. Family, have you ever had a dream before? And don't mistake it for impossible just because it's something you ain't seen before. Peace, y'all. Thank you. is a research and training center housed at Georgetown University. Amenovitz Initiative for Labor and the Working Poor is a research and training center housed at Georgetown University, the nation's oldest Catholic and Jesuit university. It serves a network of community organizations, worker advocacy groups, and unions that are reshaping the time-honored principle of collective bargaining to deal with the complex problems workers face in the 21st century. The moment I stepped in at CTU was the right, the right place for me. I would say is that community is the number one building block. We're talking about social justice. We're talking about um, things that happen in our lives. Whatever I'm going to end up doing at CTU will allow me or give me the tools to go back to my community. This new way of um, seeing myself and how I grow, like whatever comes forward, doing it with the same drive or the same motivation will be just as important. At JVC Northwest, Jesuit volunteers spend one or more years serving full-time with partner agencies in fields such as education, environmental stewardship, and public health, while living with other JVs in intentional community. From Alaska to Montana to Oregon, Idaho, and Washington, JVC Northwest has grown into a movement that exceeds a year of service. It is a movement for simplicity, for justice, for intentional community, and radical love. If you were disappointed last night not to be included in the roll call, we will finally get everyone right now. So get ready for our final roll call. St. Ignatius College Preparatory in California. John Carroll University. Loyola Blakefield. Lemoyne College. St. Andrew Nativity School. Loyola Academy in Illinois. St. Ignatius College Prep in Illinois. Loyola High School of Los Angeles. 
Xavier High School, New York. Christ the King Jesuit College Prep. St. Joseph's Preparatory School. Loyola Marymount University. Sacred Heart Preparatory in California. Loyola University, Chicago. St. Ignatius High School, Cleveland. St. John's Prep, Massachusetts. Loyola Marymount University, again. Yeah. <laughs> St. Joseph's University. Loyola School, New York City. Villa Maria Academy High School. Villanova University. St. Joseph Academy, Ohio. Walsh Jesuit High School. Christo Ray Jesuit High School, Baltimore. St. Charles Borromeo Skill, Skillman, New Jersey. Regis High School, New York City. Rockhurst High School. St. Joseph Notre Dame High School. No Seattle University. Central Catholic High School, Oregon. Crystal Ray Jesuit High School, Illinois. Gasu Catholic Church, Michigan. Brybuff Jesuit Preparatory School. Catholic University of America. Scranton Preparatory School. And last but certainly not least, McQuay Jesuit High School. And now let's hear from more of our incredible IFTJ sponsors. Welcome to the Jesuit School of Theology of Santa Clara University, a graduate theological center where you can learn at the intersection of scholarship, religion, and culture. At JST, you'll engage with your faith through approaches grounded in the 21st century, the church's global context, and our Jesuit identity. Join our vibrant community of scholars, ministers, and change makers to discover how you can serve our world. One of the coolest things about being an O'Hare Fellow at America Media is getting to cover Catholic news from all over the country, in print, online, and through audiovisual media. Every day, we're working on different projects, learning new skills, pitching stories, and collaborating with other thoughtful Catholic journalists. And we do all of this while living and working in one of the most vibrant and diverse cities in the world. If you're a college senior interested in writing or producing through a Catholic lens, then apply for next year's O'Hare Fellowship. Visit O'HareFellows.org for details.
All right. Um, I think we really need to always recognize our leaders. And right now, one of our leaders in this country is the good people of Georgia, where we've, who have experienced tremendous violence. If you remember the Asian women who were murdered brutally there, the voter suppression that's going on, the land back movements, the people of Georgia is lead, are leading the way, are teaching us. Haiti is teaching us what courage is about. So this little old song. Georgia, Georgia, the whole day through, just an, an old sweet song keeps. Georgia on my mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Georgia, Georgia, a song of you. Comes a sweet and clear and moonlight through the pine. Other arms reach out to me. Other eyes smile tenderly, yeah. still in peaceful dreams I see the road leads back to you. Sweet song, keep Georgia on my mind. Mm, that's, this has been my prayer for our country, the leadership of Georgia. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Georgia, my Asian sisters, Georgia, my black brothers, Georgia, Mexicanas working in the fields of Georgia, Muskogee Creek, mm, Georgia, yeah, all the way across Georgia. Mm -hmm. Senator Warnock, Georgia. Stacy Abrams, Georgia. Stacy Abrams, Georgia. Stacy Abrams, Georgia. Souls to the polls, Georgia. Win that vote, huh? Georgia.
Father, arms reach out to me. Ooh. Other eyes smile tenderly, still in peaceful dreams I see. The road leads back to you. I find just an old sweet song keeps Georgia on my mind just an old sweet song keeps Georgia Oh, mama. Lead the way. Lead the way. Kurt Coley from Ohio in the lead. Thank you once again, Francisco. One more round. We are now excited to welcome our final Ignatian Network speakers to the stage. Anne Anish, a student at St. Ignatius College Preparatory, and Carlos Rodriguez, a 2017 graduate of Seattle University, former Jesuit volunteer, and current grad student at Merrimack College. I love eating with my hands. I love dancing to silly Bollywood music. I love that my hair always smells like curry. And I love that my house smells like cardamom and chai. These experiences bring me back home to my roots, to the stories of who I am and where I come from. I am Indian, I am South Asian, and I am proudly Asian American. Growing up, there was always an emphasis on the South Asian part of my identity. And as an incoming freshman in high school, I was looking for a place to nurture and grow this part of myself. However, I was put in a pretty peculiar situation. I decided to attend a Jesuit high school in San Francisco, St. Ignatius College Preparatory, a predominantly white institution. As a minority in this environment, Naturally, I wanted to find people who would relate to me. I mean, who was gonna dance to the Bollywood music and sing in the middle of the choir? I wanted to find a community with people who shared my love for the same foods, for the same music, and celebrated the same events as me. People who knew my story. This is when I was introduced to the Asian Students Coalition. In other words, ASC an affinity group for students identifying as Asian or Asian American at my school. But to give some context, it wasn't perfect. Out of at least 448 Asian identifying students at St. Ignatius, only 23 identified as South Asian. I didn't feel that my experience of being South Asian was at all being represented. I could sum up my entire affinity group experience to one quote. I remember going to ASC's celebration of Diwali, the Festival of Lights, and hearing a fellow member murmur to their friends, I don't know what we're all doing here. I'm Asian, not Indian. It was hard to hear comments like these at South Asian events sponsored by ASC, to the point that I no longer wanted to keep this relationship. I was tired. Why was I not included in this idea of what is Asian? How can I fix this? 
How can I be represented the way I want to be? My first response was to try and create a completely new affinity group, separate from ASC and solely for South Asian students, but my request was denied. The answer was that there was already an affinity group for South Asian identifying students, so why was I trying to make another? After advocating for another six months, the moderators of the affinity space came to a consensus. It was valuable for all Asian students to remain united in their shared experience, even if that did not include mine. And so I was faced with two choices. I could do nothing, or I could join ASC. And so I decided to join the leadership of the affinity group. And when chosen, I had other plans in mind. I wanted to go in with my own agenda. I was acting out of a place of frustration and anger. I mean, I wanted to show these kids where they went wrong, how they hurt my feelings, rather than help them make things right. But by being in leadership, I realized that there was so much more to being Asian than I had known. And despite my initial resistance to joining ASC, it has been a space that is receptive to dialogue and responds to the needs of South Asian students at my school. This year, the Diwali celebration is going to be much larger and much more influential than the past years. It will bring together students, parents, and even teachers. My leadership in ASC has opened the door for other South Asian students to see themselves in this affinity group. Representation does matter. Seeing people who look like you in a space that you want to be in does matter. I've realized that by wanting to start a separate South Asian affinity group, I was in some ways contributing to the stereotype of South Asia versus all of the rest of Asia. I was contributing to the us versus them mentality, furthering the divide in my community. There are a lot of experiences that Asian Americans share. Our fight to be visible in American society, dismantling systems reinforced by white supremacy, but the Asian Students Coalition has given me a community that affirms my South Asian roots while also renewing my idea of what it means to be Asian. There's an Ignatian concept called Ajre Contra, to act against. Sometimes God calls us to lean into our discomfort, our fear, our doubt. The concept of Ajre Contra encourages us to examine our lives and walk into those places of discomfort. I live this out in my own life by taking steps deeper into an environment that I was not comfortable in. And now, I find comfort in the very space I was working to divide. My challenge to you today is to ask yourself, where do you feel fear? Where do you feel discomfort and doubt? Where do you feel called? When have you encountered resistance? And what is preventing you from being free? So you might be wondering, How would I answer any of these questions that I've given you? And the best way I can describe it is through a quote. You were created to do good work, work that inspires and empowers, liberates and transforms, restores and softens. Yes, work can be hard, as it was meant to be. The verb itself calls us into action, rejecting passivity and demanding sustained effort. It provokes, agitates, and disturbs. But this work, the call for justice, is good work. It defends the oppressed and frees the captive. It tears down walls and destroys barriers. It changes things. So when you feel weary or hopeless or spent, remind yourself that the darkness is being flooded by marvelous light. Yes, this is work, and it is good. The process was draining and tiring, but I felt loved and empowered every step of the way when I remembered that I'm not doing this just for me. I was doing this for all the other South Asian students that trusted me. After joining leadership and experiencing a different side of the affinity space, I realized that we do belong. 
we really do belong. I am only just beginning to understand how my faith, my identity, and my work for justice are all interconnected. So I call you. Take a moment today, tomorrow, whenever you feel called to, and listen to your most rooted self. What is it telling you? What is it asking of you? What is your story? It is through your rootedness that renewal is there to work towards justice. This is who I am. I am Anne Anish. I am rooted and renewed as an Ignatian. I am an immigrant. I am South Asian. And I am a leader of the, state, the Asian Students Coalition. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. The word sonder, as defined by John Koning, is a realization that each random passerby is living a life as vivid and complex as your own, populated with their own ambitions, friends, routines, worries, and inherited wildness, an epic story that continues invisibly around you like an anthill sprawling deep underground with elaborate passageways to thousands of others that thousands of other lives that you'll never know existed, in which you might appear only once, as an extra sipping coffee in the background, as a blur of traffic passing on the highway, as a lighted window at dusk. My story begins when I was three years old. My parents made a choice that changed the course of my life. My mother packed her few belongings, grabbed my brother and I, and we began our odyssey through the desolate concrete line border to the vibrant city of El Paso. Texas. That sandy trudge from my birth town of Celaya, Guanajuato, Mexico, to my new home was uneventful. There were no ICE agents, no interrogations, and no questions over basic humanity. That very moment when I stepped onto U.S. soil, I was branded with infamy and labeled undocumented in American society. My undocumented status has presented roadblocks, challenges, and a deep anxiety. But within these obstacles and fear, my status has gifted me a fundamental belief in human dignity and a commitment to lifting up others, a commitment and belief that has shaped my sense of purpose. At age 15, the government of Alabama approved House Bill 56, a sweeping bill denying public benefits, housing, and education to undocumented immigrants. My family and I were homeless but sheltered at the time and living in a nearby Hispanic community across state lines in the state of Florida. When HB 56 passed, thousands of undocumented immigrant children fled in exodus to this community. Their parents sent them away from the public grade schools that began asking colleges, uh, that began asking them about their immigration status. To this day, I am barred from attending many public colleges in Alabama and other states like my so-called home state of Georgia. For many, HB 56, HB 56 may seem like a meek policy, but it's shaped the path of public policy and advocacy that I want to pursue. The political perspective of our immigration system is just that, one perspective. Immigration, however political it may be, is more than that. It is about how we treat others and how we show compassion. It is about the rights of migration keeping families together, and creating a welcoming society. It is about uprooting and weeding out the oppressive structures so immigrants have an environment where they can bloom. Oftentimes, I have noticed a paradox of moving to a new country for a better life. Moving to a new country only to live day to day with the fear of deportation or hiding in the shadows is no way to live. Contributing to a new country only to live without proper wages or labor, labor protections is no way to live. This is the paradox that gnaws through the daily decisions I make. It is the reason we feel we are in limbo, uncertain of our future, and constantly having our dreams deferred. But adelante, we move on. As time went on, 
I realized that there was so much more to be done in our community. I wanted to be involved in social movement building, activism, and being in service with others, something that I believe has a great impact in communities that need it the most. And in August of, 20, of 2018, I had the privilege of serving as a full-time volunteer with the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. For two years, I was helping undocumented survivors of human trafficking and abuse obtain humanitarian visas in the Southwest. Here, I saw firsthand the effects of both valuable and ineffective public policy. This is the form of leadership and, accompany, and accompaniment. This form of leadership and accompaniment is taking the initiative to get through the tough, toughest obstacles to reach your goals. Like a sprout cresting through the soil to find the light, it moves out of the shadows and into a place of warmth where you can flourish. In the face of constraints, I work to use the power and privilege I do have to help, my, to help aid migrants and refugees, because I know the story of migration is mightier, mightier than the individual. And most importantly, the story, of, the story of the movement of people is about policies that impede the recovery from trauma or access to education, housing, and healthcare, access often reserved for those with wealth and power. My story is a glimpse into the intersection of migration and public policy. The most frightening and shameful moments of my life were at the hands of atrocious public policy. From the public humil humiliation of being denied housing when my family lacked a social security number, to being blocked from public education. But each experience is unique, and we should hold on to these moments, these sometimes tragic moments. They are heartbreaking stories that have added to the, to the immigrant experience in the US. It is important to know and understand that the history of immigration, the history of immigration includes Chinese exclusion and Japanese internment during World War II. We must recognize that we are not all immigrants. We are on land taken away from indigenous people that once stewarded it. We are living on stolen land with people who were enslaved and forced to endure the Middle Passage. Their stories must be recognized in the immigration conversation as well. These moments of trauma, while still deeply painful, have gifted me an unwavering belief in seeing human dignity in all. After all these experiences, I feel rooted in my faith of humanity and spirituality, and renewed, knowing that God has given me the grace to grow and serve afresh with each passing year. I'm here as a living example, I'm here as a living example of the importance of advocacy and resilience, and to prove to you that no matter where you come from or what hardships you might experience, there will always be a way to keep moving forward. I will continue to use my voice to shape public policy and protect those targeted because of certain identities, like the color of their skin, religion, nationality, or sexual orientation. We are all different seeds with different capabilities and different characteristics and different beginnings. And I hope that my story encourages the conversation around immigration as it relates to our faith and spirituality, not just in places of worship, but in your homes, schools, wherever you go. You have welcomed me here today, and I am incre incredibly gracious for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you again to Anne and Carlos for sharing with us. And we now welcome Pedro de Velasco to the stage for our policy briefing on migration. Pedro is Director of Education and Advocacy for the Kino Border Initiative. So please welcome Pedro to the stage. Thank you. Hola, buenas tardes. <laughs> Thank you, I love you too. <laughs> uh, so I'm, it, it is a real pleasure to be uh, with you today. Uh, my name is Pedro de Velasco. I'm a migrant from Mexico, and I'm also the Director of Education and Advocacy with the Kino Border Initiative. We're a binational Catholic organization that provides direct humanitarian assistance and holistic accompaniment, accompaniment to migrants in Nogales, Sonora, Mexico. And we also do uh, policy advocacy both in the US and Mexico. So today I'm here to talk to you about migration policy. So when we talk about migration policy, we refer to what the government decides to do with the non-citizen people intending to come and also with the ones that are already here. Um, 
so the first one is border policy, and the second one is interior or uh, interior policy or enforcement. So uh, when we talk about um, border policy, we need to discuss asylum. And uh, so yeah, after the horrors of the Holocaust of World War II, uh, the world decided on the Refugee Convention, never again we're going to allow this to happen. And they set up the, the, the rules, the principles of uh, the rights of the people fleeing violence and persecution. So uh, an asylum seeker is a person who is fleeing particularly this violence, this persecution in her home country, and therefore is seeking the protection of another government, in this case, the United States. So before 2018, uh, if a, a person was fleeing violence or persecution in their home country, they were able to present themselves at the port of entry, at the border uh, between Mexico and the United States, and request to be admitted in the United States to begin the long and complicated asylum process. And if they were able to prove that they were fearing this violence and persecution and that it was originated by their race or their nationality or their ethnicity, I mean, or their religion or their membership to a certain group or uh, their political opinion, then they could be granted asylum. But uh, what's happening right now is, you know, since March 20 of 2020, we've been having uh, Title 42. So the Trump administration find uh, the perfect excuse uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic to effectively block access to asylum for everyone at the border. So right now, asylum seekers, when they arrive to Nogales with us, they're learning for the first time that it is virtually impossible to access asylum in the United States. So they're stuck in Nogales. Uh, those of you who were here uh, last night, you might have heard the testimony of Roberto Carlos, who is a migrant from Cuernavaca, Morelos, and him and his family were stuck in Nogales for over a year before having a chance to be able to cross and just begin the asylum process. So uh, this situation has been going on at the border for over two years and a half now. On April 1st of this year, the Center for Disease Control announced that uh, you know, they could now terminate Title 42 after May 23 of this year. They say that it was no longer necessary, not that it ever was, uh, to suspend the right to asylum trying to mitigate uh, the COVID-19 transmission. But only two days after, attorney generals from um, Arizona, Louisiana, and Missouri, they filed a lawsuit against this order of termination, and then, no surprise, other 18 states followed. And basically, they were against this termination. So in May 20, just three days before uh, Title 42 was supposed to come to an end, the district judge, Summer Hayes, in uh, Louisiana, he blocked the Biden administration from ending Title 42. So um, I remember back then when we were sharing the news with the migrants that, again, had been waiting for over a year in Nogales uh, for a chance to request asylum, and uh, a good friend, Victor, he was sharing, you know, like, okay, a couple of months may not seem like too much, but I, not might, I might not be alive in two months. And, you know, some people say, like, okay, well, it's a court decision. What, what can the Congress do? What can the Biden administration do? But that, there's been legislative efforts trying to keep Title 42 in place, to make it into law, such as the Langford and Cinema bipartisan bill. And also, uh, you might have heard on the news that quite recently the Biden administration has engaged in efforts to expand Title 42. Right now, uh, Venezuelan families are being expelled from the United States under Title 42. And before they were exempted of Title 42. But this is just the first uh, other nationality included that was before exempted because uh, officials from the government of Mexico have shared with us that the Biden administration intention is to expand Title 42 to other nationalities, including Nicaraguans and Cubans. So that's what's going on at the border. Let's talk a little bit about the interior. So we were, we were saying like it's what you decide to do with the people that are intending to come, but it's also what you want to do with the people that are already here. So there are over 10 million undocumented immigrants in the United States, and they, they are undocumented not by choice because they have no access to a pathway to citizenship. 
So there's an easy solution. The Congress should and could uh, pass legislation that will allow undocumented immigrants, such as DACA recipients, TPS holders, farm workers, and other essential workers to obtain their citizenship. That way ensuring you know, that their permanency in the United States. And also it is important to make sure that it is you know, accessible regardless of your economic status and uh, you know, guaranteeing that all immigrants are treated with dignity and respect. Uh, so I don't know if, if you know of this, but DACA and TPS are actually not, not a, a status. And I, I understand if you're tricked because uh, TPS is actually the temporary protective status, but it's not an immigration status and grants no pathway to citizenship. DACA and TPS are only like band-aids that prevent or defer deportation from happening. That's what you, you have the name deferred action. That is specifically for people that arrive as children to the United States. And the temporary protection status is for people that uh, because of violence or em environmental crisis in their countries, they cannot return. So therefore they are granted with this kind of like limbo band-aid thing that it's not even a status, not a pathway to citizenship, but can end at any given time. So it is, the solution is easy, change the law and grant them access to citizenship. So when you go out there with the Congress, when you have your uh, advocacy meetings, it is really important to be concrete with your asks. Uh, we want you to publicly oppose and denounce not only the continuation but also the expansion of Title 42. We want you to oppose any legislation or reconciliation package intended to keep Title 42 in place. We want you to support policies that restore access to asylum and due process for asylum seekers. And we want you to support legislation that creates pathways to citizenship for undocumented immigrants without conditioning it in, on increasing border security because that's fairly common. They say like, okay, yes, we will grant uh, a pathway to citizenship for DACA recipients, but we will increase border security. We will close our borders even tighter and make it harder for people to come. But that's not negotiable. You you don't get to choose dignity here, but not here. But you you need to you know facilitate migration with dignity for all. So um, thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any other questions, feel free to uh, ask. We will be at the table up there. So thank you again. <laughs> and now I would like to reintroduce Lou from the Peace Poets to give another lovely poem. So let's give a nice round of applause. If you down to do climate justice work, let me see your hand in the air. If you're doing racial justice work right now, let me, put, let me, let me see the hand in the air. What about gender justice? What about climate justice? Look around, see who's around. Look at these hands. It's people who are about to do this. This poem right here, first of all, they want to make our, 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 our movements feel divided and separate. But anybody fighting for justice is your people. And so we need to be able to see that in each other when we look around, all right? Thank you to Ann, thank you to Carlos, thank you to Pedro one more time. Just gratitude for y'all. Thank you for those powerful words. We heard you. This poem is about how we struggle for justice. When I say come write a song with me, I mean, come become strong with me. 
And when I say come and sing with me, I mean become the wind with me. And if you finna win with me, then come be the symphony. Cause we need freedom movements that are rocking. Like it's midnight on the dance floor and the DJ not stopping. I'm talking about composing chants so golden that we could hold light with our hands still open. And we could have protests that everyone noticed cause we are the boldest, most beautiful opus flowing right through the walls cause nothing can hold us. And I know that you know this beautiful feeling of melodies molding us into healing when you feel that yes of our voices revealing us interwoven. So yeah, I'm hoping that you open to composing freedom songs we could sing from the Bronx to Oakland. Gathering organizations, that's right. Gathering organizations and writing original jams for justice and liberation. I'm just saying, I don't know why we waited. Because we could have songs to pass on hard-earned wisdom. Songs to celebrate the powerful leadership of women. We could have songs to keep us on the same beat. And songs to tell everybody, yo, it's time to take the street. We could have songs to release our pain. And songs to lift up our campaigns. We could have songs that change everything. How it feels to go to work, how it feels to be alive, because when you're carrying a song, what you really have is the power to change the vibe. So instead of meetings that start with, all right, cool, what's on the agenda? We could open our hearts with a song that honors the dignity of all of our members and then close out with a chant. For those who taught us to remember, we gonna organize until justice is real. And we won't stop cause it's raining. We'll pour down like we made it. I'm talking about being creative. That's why this is a poem promoting a training cause we are way too amazing to just follow the norm. And if we sound and look like the system we are trying to change, my people, we got lost in the storm. But if we have the courage to bring out the voice inside us, it will become the voice that unite us. And the rest of the world gonna be like, damn, that's the voice that should guide us. And then it won't matter if they try to keep us lost and divided because our souls will still riot with the most profound truth that you are part of me. And if we sing out into this darkness, we going to find each other in the harmony. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just wanted to do that piece in particular. Um, you know, for, for us, music, um, a lot of times in our movements, I'm looking at a bunch of leaders of our, of our movements, people who are ready to dedicate their lives to justice and liberation. And I wanted to do that poem because for me, um, I'm, uh, all the time experiencing just that longing for us to put art, poetry, music in the center of our movements. And so as the Peace Poets, like we're down to be of service to you, wherever you at, it's a school, it's an organization, um, bring us out, like that's a real invitation. When I say come write a song with us, holler at us, let us know. Thank you so much. Thank you once again, Lou. And now I am so excited to introduce our final keynote speaker of the weekend, Olga Segura. <laughs> Olga Segura is a freelance writer and the author of Birth of Movement, Black Lives Matter and the Catholic Church, published in February of 2021. Previously, she was the opinion editor at National Catholic Reporter and an associate editor at America Media, where she wrote and solicited articles on race and culture. She is a co-founder and former co-host of the podcast Jesuitical. Her writing has appeared in The Guardian, Latino Rebels, Shondaland, Sojourners, Refinery29, and The Revealer. Prior to working at America Media, Media, Olga was an intern at the permanent mission of the Dominican Republic to the United Nations. She graduated from Fordham University with a, bachelor, with a Bachelor of Arts in English and a Bachelor of Arts in Italian Language and Literature and is originally from Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic. Please join me in welcoming Olga Segura. Hello. Ooh. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to take a second to look around since this is the largest crowd I've ever had in my years at the teaching. So thank you all for choosing to be in community with me today. And thank you to the Ignatian Solidarity Network for always inviting me to be a part of this space. Even before I wrote a book and everyone knew who I was, I was invited into this space to think about liberation and justice in really beautiful ways. And I just love being able to engage with so many students from across the country. So thank you all for being here with me. Also, I'm a millennial, so I will be awkwardly reading from my phone. So bear with me if I lose my place. So I want to begin by naming my sisters and brothers in the Haitian struggle. The Biden administration has deported 20,000 Haitians since his inauguration. Haiti for years has been undergoing political turmoil, police violence, the assault of protesters, political assassinations. I want to ground today's talk, my call to action for the church and all Catholics who care about liberation in the history and the resistance the revolutionary spirit of the Haitian people. And I encourage you all to follow and learn from Woy Magazine, which is a newsletter and media project founded and written by Haitians. My work is aimed at helping everyone who encounters it, from whatever your lived experience might be, to think and act on a commitment to helping all persons thrive. My work is grounded in the belief that everyone deserves to have their needs met that every person is worthy of dignity and flourishing in our society and in our world. My Catholic faith demands that I name and confront white supremacy and the role Christianity has played in sustaining it, especially as we see growing efforts that continue to deprive already marginalized people of their autonomy. By acknowledging this relationship and by further understanding how imperialism and colonialism have shaped our world, we can begin to transform our church, our country, and our world. This is especially important at this moment in history. This year, we've seen Moroccan migrants who died at the border with Spain. We see black migrants who have died in trailers at the US border and Mexico. Haitian migrants who continue to be abused at the hands of the state and who continue to be disregarded and erased from Catholic media conversations about migration. Our Catholic faith demands that we name these various tragedies and work to eliminate oppressive systems that destroy our world's most marginalized, the very systems that lead to these crises that we are seeing worldwide. For me, in order to understand how to do this work, and in order to understand the role my faith plays in this, in order to maintain the hope and courage to keep doing this work, it begins with abolition. Abolition Feminism Now is a book by Angela Davis, Gina Dent, Erica R. Miners, and Beth E. Ritchie. In this book, they write that abolition is both a mode of analysis and a political practice. They add, abolition feminism has always been a politics, the refusal to co-sign co humans and other beings to disposability, inseparable from practice. How can one use an abolitionist framework to think more critically about our faith? How can this abolitionist framework help us as Catholics to hope amid so much collective death? And how can this framework challenge us as Catholics, as believers of Christ who are called to respond at this moment in our church and nation's history? I've been sitting with these questions for some time now. These questions and what it means to think about abolition as Catholics continue to be the, at the heart of my own work and commitment to justice, resistance, and liberation. Yet this is not easy work, and these questions do not have easy answers. This work is not meant to be simple or stagnant. This work is not meant to be done alone. As Davis and co write in Abolition Feminism, this work is never a solo project. Individuals tire, fade, movements deepen and continue. Sometimes the group is only a few folks working together in a church basement, but these gatherings, networks, and ad hoc or formal groups create insurgent sites of political education that build relationships, share language, strategy, tools, and analysis. And these spaces create openings for people to learn and to practice. What tools are available to hold someone accountable if we don't call the police? Collectivism is a thorough line across generations, peoples, and mobilizations, undervalued and unrecognized, but key to freedom making. 
This understanding has been crucial to my own work, organizing and writing. I'm from New York City, and we have very deeply felt the impact of a pandemic that has killed more than one million Americans. In my hometown, more than 69,000 people have lost their lives. Thousands have lost health insurance, jobs, savings, and their homes. And it has disproportionately affected black, indigenous, Latinx, and other people of color, communities which still continue to face violence at the hands of armed police officers. As I was processing these tragedies while also working on Birth of a Movement, my father got COVID, my partner's father got COVID, and many of our friends lost relatives, jobs, and amid all that, cops were still shooting black Americans. Violence against trans women and men was still rising, and gentrifiers were still heading into our Bronx neighborhoods. I began to sit with what it means to exist and survive in a state of constant anxiety how that anxiety becomes a state of constant surveillance, how that constant state of self-surveillance, already compounded by state violence and surveillance, impacts every part of my life, including my relationship to God. Amid so much death, I struggled to find hope. Ooh, sorry, I told you guys I was gonna lose my place, and I did, all right. So amid so much collective death, I really struggled to find hope. I struggled to pray, I struggled to even believe if this work was worth doing. And I didn't really emerge from that space until I attended the Black Catholic Theological Symposium in the fall of last year. The gathering took place at Notre Dame and it included black scholars, theologians, and clergy. And it was here where I met individuals like Dr. Valerie D. Lewis Mosley, a brilliant pastoral theologian, activist, and professor. If you aren't familiar with her work, I recommend you go and read her essay, My Unbridled Tongue Challenges Inequities That Threaten Black Women's Lives, which she wrote in July of 2020. During my time at Notre Dame, I listened to Valerie talk to younger activists, including high school and college students. She reminded them of the importance of caring for one's body. She emphasized the need, she emphasized the need to bring our healthy whole selves to whatever advocacy work we do as Catholics. And this was health rooted in loving and caring for oneself. She described the love and hope in Jesus's ministry, the power and love of Christ on the cross, and she challenged me. She challenged how I think about abolition and the Catholic faith. She helped me to begin to understand that an abolitionist framework, if applied to our daily lives, demanded that we imagine and hope for and strive outside of the tragedies around us and not by further breaking ourselves, but by relying on our communities. Community building was a way to build and create systems outside of the ones around us, systems outside of the violence of our world. It took me months to fully realize how pivotal that moment was for my own life. Valerie inspired me and revitalized my commitment to my own vocation, to my faith, to liberation. I witnessed an intergenerational moment in which she shared her wisdom with someone younger than us both. And that reminded me of the power of sharing knowledge, the power of telling stories, the power of being in community, the power of dreaming and building, the power of abolition as practice in my faith in life. She pointed me back to why I began reporting on the Black Lives Matter movement in 2014, why I wrote the book in 2020, why I write and speak about it today. It is a movement that taught an entire generation how to imagine, fight for, and build a world that refuses to co-sign human beings and other beings to, dispos to disposability. In 2013, following the acquittal of George Zimmerman and the killing of Trayvon Martin, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi created the Black Lives Matter movement. At the time, it was mostly an online campaign on Twitter and Facebook to help empower organizers, especially younger ones, by providing them with the tools and resources to think about and fight for racial justice. The founders, in the summer of 2014, along with more than 400 organizers from all across the country, traveled to Ferguson, Missouri. This was shortly after Michael Brown Jr. was killed. These organizers, a majority of whom were women and men in the LGBTQ community, helped to support the marchers who were facing daily violence from law enforcement. Since its birth almost 10 years ago, this movement has grown to include chapters all across the country, providing resources on restorative justice, abolition, and conflict resolution. 
It is a movement centered around inclusion, affirming and centering the experiences of black, queer, and trans women and men, and working toward a world where all black people are liberated and free. The movement taught me how to respond to the world around me. It taught me to pay attention to the most marginalized voices in, an, in our nation, how to uplift these voices while also learning from them as a writer. By teaching me how to uplift these communities, I began to learn how white supremacy conditions us to erase these experiences, how it disempowers blackness, how it conditions us to believe that we are not enough without whiteness. I began to understand how patriarchal white power moves in every institution in America, including our church. I was learning about privilege while also coming of age on Twitter, like a true millennial. And I was existing in spaces where I was accepting my own blackness while also understanding how this same oppressed body was privileged. How this privilege allows me to move in spaces and with power not afforded to darker skinned women. Through the online hashtag, I was introduced to social critics outside the movement who embodied the tenets of the founders and who helped me to think more deeply about why and how this movement was born. This includes thinkers like Sahira Kelly, Zoe Zadmudzi, Dwayne David Paul, and William C. Anderson. These thinkers were, like the founders and organizations of the BLM movement, using social media to help other followers think more, more deeply about blackness, abolition, sexuality, colorism, and capitalism. The more I internalized the mission of these women and organizers around the movement, the more I began to challenge the whiteness of American Catholicism both internally and externally. In 2014 and 2015, I started attending protests and interviewing activists. I began talking with other black Catholics about what this movement meant and how it could challenge our church's leadership to commit itself more fully to our communities. We talked about the role this movement, this movement was playing and how we understood and responded to the signs of the times, how it challenged our conscientiousness and our relationship to Catholicism. I was born in the Dominican Republic, a black Catholic country in the Caribbean that shares an island with another black Catholic country. Yet I did not acknowledge my own black Catholic identity, my family and my own nation's history and ties to Haiti until my mid twenties when I began reporting on this movement. And it was through this reporting that I began to unlearn and begin to truly understand my own black immigrant Caribbean Catholic identity, one that was extremely privileged and also oppressed one that was radically and refreshingly different from the whiteness of mainstream American Catholicism. This movement helped me to begin to ask questions internally, while also presenting how these questions and themes were shaping the stories I was writing. It forced me to begin to decolonize my Christianity, to begin to imagine my faith, in the, out, to imagine my faith outside of the colonialist violence that introduced the faith to my homeland. And most importantly, how to center voices who were not getting centered in our church or in our media. These movements taught me how to be Catholic, how to be a Catholic writer, how to live out what Pope Francis was preaching. He constantly calls on us to understand how consumerism under capitalism and systemic oppression are related, how both intersect with white supremacy and vice versa. He calls us to, and I quote, to get to know people, listen, expand the circle of ideas, end quote. Being open in the ways God is moving us and calling us to respond to the world around us means that we are, Francis preaches, to find the courage to leave the confines of our own security and comfort, to become bruised, hurting, and dirty as we joyfully approach the suffering other in a spirit of solidarity. For white people committed to authentic, radical, anti-racism work, Solidarity must include a dialogue around power, who has it and who does not. This means acknowledging and working to relinquish this power. This means recognizing and thinking and talking about white privilege, how white supremacy and racial capitalism have benefited you while simultaneously exploiting and killing communities of color, and how these privileges are present in daily, seemingly mundane interactions including those that occur in our academic, religious, and media spaces. If you truly care about solidarity, if you truly care about black lives, about creating a more inclusive church and nation, about faith-based advocacy, then it means asking yourselves, 
What am I willing to give up to truly center and uplift marginalized women, children, and men? How am I willing to imagine and fight for a freer, more liberated church and world? How am I going to demand that whatever Catholic space I occupy uplift black people? Being concerned with anti-racism work for me as a black immigrant Catholic means con being concerned with anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist work. It means embracing and applying an abolitionist feminist framework to my work in faith. And it means allowing myself to be educated and politicized by black and brown queer organizers who are the leaders and experts in this work. In recent years, we have seen white Catholics engaging with this movement. And many were actively and consistently raising funds for organizers and mutual aid campaigns. Many were also using their various platforms to urge fellow white Catholics to support people of color being disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Many hosted Zoom book clubs and webinars where they discussed many of the topics and themes I've mentioned here tonight. Many wrote letters to their bishops. Many called out their white priests. Many listened and learned from women and men of color. All of these efforts are important and they must continue, but they are not enough and white Catholics, both lay and clergy, cannot get complacent. We must continue to confront our history. We must understand how we as a church have been shaped by the very colonialist sentiments that guided the early church and the so-called founders of this country. How those sentiments connect to the white rage and violence we saw at the Capitol, and how that anger and hate relate, and how that anger and hate relates to the inability of our church leaders to collectively engage with any movement that is not led by white men. We must demand that those writing and telling Catholic stories stop centering whiteness, white Catholics, and include the history and nuance, and include this history and nuance when we talk about the church. The United States has always encouraged white rage and violence. European colonizers, angered by the treatment they received in their homelands, arrived on Turtle Island and violently stormed and pillaged lands that were not theirs. Colonizers destroyed and attempted to erase indigenous history. Colonizers raped and murdered indigenous communities. This is genocide. The colonizers also kidnapped, forcibly transported, and sold enslaved African women, men, and children. The creation of new technology at the turn of the 20th century meant more reformed, sanitized systemic violence against citizens of color. Segregation, voting restrictions, redlining, prisons, detention centers. The United States of, the, of America has the highest number of incarcerated people, and our inequitable healthcare system has contributed to the death of thousands of Americans. White colonialist violence is how my people became Catholic. This is Catholic history, a part of our, a part of our faith that cannot be ignored. There can be no reckoning and not, no path forward for our church until our leaders, our media, and all Catholic spaces and institutions begin to repair the harm our church has caused and, continue, and continues to cause Catholics of color. I, I want to challenge white people inside and outside of our church to engage with abolitionist work, including organizers and thinkers who are inviting us to learn from the multiple ways ordinary people try to respond to interpersonal harm, particularly gender and sexual violence without resorting to police and prisons. Some questions white allies can ask themselves and all people who are committed to being allies in this work. Some questions to consider. How can white Catholics think about strategic ways to work and struggle toward liberation? What are some examples in history that we can turn to? How white is the space that I work in? If I'm part of a Catholic organization or group, whether a religious order, a school, a magazine, or a newspaper, how many people of color are allowed into that space? I want white Catholics to confront their privilege and think about how they have been and currently are complicit in systemic oppression. And I want this to inform how you relate and uplift the pro-life issues that matter to black indigenous POC communities. Black and brown mothers continue to receive inadequate medical care in the US. From primary care physicians who deny their pain to higher maternal mortality rates, Suicide remains one of the leading causes of death for indigenous youth. Black migrants continue to be abused in government cages. 
anti-Asian sentiment remains on the rise, with more than 11,000 hate incidents against the Asian American community reported between March of 2020 and March of 2022. Americans of color also face higher rates of anxiety, depression, and are more likely to suffer a heart attack or stroke. U.S. black, transgender, and non-conforming people face some of the highest forms of violence in this country. White people in our church need to hear this and understand that along with the various tragedies that threaten our livelihood, we are also suffering anxiety, depression. We are spiritually devastated. We are spiritually suffering. And this is violence every single day that is enacted upon our communities, our lives. Systemic violence every aspect of my life and the life of the people I love. White allies must ask themselves, what are some of the immediate ways I can help? What are some of the long-term ways I can help? What are some ways I can use my privilege and access and resources to center and support marginalized women, men, and children? How can I hold myself and other white people accountable while we think through strategic ways to work toward liberation? And how can I do this work without placing the burden on people of color? For Catholics, this can mean thinking more deeply about the resources and groups created at our respective parish groups on Catholic campuses and Catholic book clubs. This means asking what relationships our physical churches, parishes, media spaces, and religious leaders have to oppressive systems and practices. This means creating and imagining new ways to be Catholic allies, whether it is raising funds to bail out an organizer or whether it's raising funds for an organizer who needs their rent supported. Many of the work that is being done in these movement and these spaces is being done by black and brown, queer and trans women who are always at the forefront of these movements and often do this work unpaid. This can also mean imagining and dreaming of a Catholic allyship that has not been dreamed of before. The Black Lives Matter movement helped countless begin to understand what it means to organize. It jump-started the conscientiousness awakening for many in, of many in my generation. It helped me to begin to ask questions I had never asked before of myself or my church. In recent years, we have seen criticisms of this movement emerge, including criticisms from the families of survivors of those killed by armed white violence and black journalists who have attempted to call out the movement for transparency around how funds allocated to the movement have been used. This is an important critique, especially because it is coming from black Americans who have followed and engaged with the movement in a variety of ways. However, the criticism I often hear from white Catholics in our church is not aimed at helping the movement be accountable to the community it claims to serve. Rather, it is aimed at disparaging a movement authentically centered around blackness and a rejection of whiteness from its black queer founders to the, tr to the grassroots trans organizers that empowered the movement in Ferguson, to the black journalists who have reported and analyzed the movement's birth. This is an important distinction because we cannot lump criticisms from the black community with racist comments from white Catholics, including our bishops and priests. We need to understand the movement and how it has inspired and galvanized thousands while also learning from the thinkers who are actively forcing this movement to, loon, to learn new ways of holding itself accountable. We must understand the role this movement plays in the histories of liberation in the United States. And we must also name and understand the following. The Catholic Church, especially our male leaders, are threatened by social movements led by black queer women. As Davis, Dent, Miners, and Ritchie write in Abolition Feminism, abolition will not end all harm or interpersonal violence. We must do the work to both prevent and reduce harm while we practice and grow transformative ways to respond when harm does happen. Abolition feminism is this intentional investment of our resources to support a flourishing of our collective best selves while reclaiming accountability from the carceral regime. How can abolition help Catholics to think more deeply about our faith? How can it help us to think more deeply about questions of justice and reconciliation? How can it help us to think about how to fight for and create a world where all of creation can flourish? What does it mean to critique not just oppressive systems, but the power and privileges white bodies are allowed to hold in America, in our church, in our media? 
I encourage you to read, along with abolition feminism, Derricka Purnell's book, Becoming Abolitionist, Police, Protest, and the Pursuit of Freedom. I also encourage you to read Asada Shakur's autobiography. It was recommended to me by a friend earlier this year, and it has been crucial for my thinking this year because it is a direct account of one woman's journey as a black activist. Both these texts have helped me to ask myself many of the questions and ideas that I have shared with you today. Both invited me to think more deeply about what it means to theorize and fight for Christ-centered liberation, but also how to practically begin to apply an abolitionist framework to my daily life, including how I relate to and build with my Bronx community. Last, I also invite you to think about the role of art in this journey. Art is really important for me because I am someone who is on her mental health journey and doing this work can be very, very draining and art grounds me and allows me to hope even when hope feels really difficult. And my last parting words that I would like to leave you all with are from Nayira Wahid Salt. Decolonization requires acknowledging that your needs and desires should never come at the expense of another's life energy. It is being honest that you have been spoiled by a machine that is not feeding you freedom, but feeding you the milk of pain. Thank you all for listening today. another round of applause for Olga. All right, you know him, you love him, and he's back. Here's Francisco with some more music. Test a little more um, of the piano and the monitor, please. Folks, uh, I want to welcome my good brother, Chris Trinidad from Alameda County, St. Joseph Notre Dame Church. First timer, first time here. Let's hear for St. Joseph Notre Dame. And of course, Kurt. And of course, Brie Buff, I told you guys I would do a shout out. Brie Buff, let's hear for Brie Buff. <laughs> oh, there they are. All right. St. Ignatius talks about consolation and desolation. And St. Iggy, as we call him with much affection, says, Take her, pay attention to these moments of consolation. A moment when you're feeling strong, God's presence with you, this over this joy that we feel when we feel God's presence, right? And we root and says, root yourself in that experience. Because when the moments of desolation come, and that desolation is not this moment when you're away or feel sad. No, it's a moment when you feel separated, alienated, away from Creator away from your source. Use those memories of these moments of consolation to be able to discern as our good sister was telling us right now, Olga was giving us this information. And so this song was born here in the Ignatian family teach in for justice. As a way of doing that, that very thing of remembering, of knowing who you are, knowing who I am in this uh, tradition of following this crazy guy named Jesus. Because we, we will see a lot of folks claiming Christianity to hold a, a mass riot and a takeover of the White House. We're gonna see folks calling themselves Christians who would leave their church to go find a person of a darker skin and lynch them, hang them, 
after Mass. That's where the word picnic comes from, if you ever want to use that word again. Picnic. To hang someone. So a lot of folks, we can be lost in what we claim to be faith. And this social discernment that we're doing here, because we're not just doing social analysis, we're doing social analysis, but we're also doing discernment because we're asking, where are you calling me to be, Jesus? So this is where that song comes from. It's difficult work, sisters and brothers. This is very difficult work. It's difficult work, and we can only do it if we hold each other and we lie in the palm of God's hand. Hope.
started the program, I was really pleased and happy to find out that there were so many different uh, opportunities to, to learn more about different social justice challenges around the world. Coming to graduate education in theology from a place of life experience, which Xavier so effectively supports, brought me increased ability to sort through the mysteries, to trust in my own faith and conscience. I finally decided to reach out to the society. My, it was just before my senior year of college. I was at a point where I was living a life that was really involved at the Newman Center at the University of Kentucky. I was involved with the Focus Campus Ministry. I also had a part of my life that involved environmental activist work. I was uh, the co-coordinator of the environmental justice organization on campus. And then I was, I was really interested in academic work. So I was a double major in English and music and found that to be a really fulfilling part of my life. And I started to wonder, how could I make all these things work together? In prayer, I found a challenge a challenge that met the frustrations, the sufferings, the um, difficulties of the world with my own desires, my own hopes, my own dreams. Thank you to all of our sponsors this weekend who make the teach possible. And we have a few announcements before we break, but please don't leave. If you can pause, if you're on the way out, if you can pause right now. Pause. Francisco and the Peace Poets will be helping us with uh, a closing song. Um, so please stick around so that you don't miss it. But before that, we just have a few announcements to close out this section of the teach -in. First of all, let's give another round of applause, or maybe the first round of applause, to the incredible staff working here at the Washington Hilton. Thank you to all those staff members who have helped us keep uh, safe and keep pretty much on schedule through the whole weekend. Um, thank them for all that they have helped us out with. And now we have some important announcements about Mass. So number one, if you are participating in the Mass Choir, please meet at the main stage at 4.45 p.m. Two, readers and Eucharistic ministers should be meeting at the front of the stage at 6 p.m. Three, Mass will take place right here in the International Ballroom at 6.30 p.m. And it's also on the back of your cards too if you need a reference. And four, the offertory collection during Mass will support the work of the Nation Solidarity Network, including ISN's efforts to sustain the energy at the teach-in throughout the year. It's possible to make a donation via Venmo or online at nationsolidary.net as well. Please be generous if you can. We appreciate you. Tonight, we have an advocacy help desk available for anyone in need of support or who might be panicking. As, you're prep for, as you prep for advocacy meetings tomorrow. Members of the IFTJ Advocacy Committee will be available to answer any lingering questions tonight at 7.30 p.m. at the IFTJ Advocacy Desk on the Terrace Levels. For our public witness location tomorrow, we will be gathering tomorrow morning at 9.15 a.m. Please note, this year's public witness will take place near the Capitol reflect, reflecting pool between the Capitol building and the National Mall. A map is available in your program book, and if you have any questions, please see the registration desk. And lastly, we'll be calling uh, Francisco and Lou, and I think maybe the Peace Poets as well, up to the stage for our send-off. But before we do that, we just want to thank all of you for the joy that it's been to be with you through this teach-in. We hope you have a wonderful advocacy day tomorrow. Oh my gosh, yeah. One, two, one, 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 two, one, two, here we go. Family, we're going to close out in a powerful way with a song that actually comes from the movement this teaching is rooted in. When I was a student, uh, I was actually at this teaching in Georgia, um, and it was my mentor, Francisco, who was there leading song. Give it up one time for Francisco. 
This is the piece, one of the, just for us, one of the Peace Poets' greatest teachers and inspirations. And so it's an honor to walk with him, to sing with him, because it's not just about the music we make. And this song right here is called No Mas No More. Let me hear you say, No Mas No More. No Mas No More. Now you imagine what's actually still happening in this country, because this is a song to cry out. It comes from the time when people in this room, including Francisco, were doing that work of walking with the Salvadoran people in the middle of civil war, in the middle of people being disappeared. This is still the reality of our world. So say it like you mean it. Say no mas, no more. No mas, no more. And so I trust that you're ready to respond to this war, that you're ready not just to sing this song, but to live this life. And so we're going to go ahead and get into it. And y'all not going to be shy about this. You're going to sing it like you mean it. Am I right? Yeah. That's what I'm talking and about. I, and I want to sp say a special shout out to my mentors over there, John Bauman, Loretta Holstein, who got this thing going from the first place. So let's shout it out for all the folks. <laughs> Bob Holstein, Breast and, Breast and Power, all the people who got the tent going on. <laughs> Goes like this, it's in the in the screen right there. No mas, no more, cry the hills of Salvador. And for the mountains of Virginia, we cry out, no mas, no more. No mas, no more, we will stop these dirty wars. Compañeras, compañeras, we cry out, no mas, no more. Let me hear you now, let me hear you, ready? Let's go. No mas, no more. Of Salvador, and for the mountains of Virginia, we cry out, no mas, no more, no mas, no more. We will stop these dirty boys, compañero, compañero. We cry out, no mas, no more. Beautiful, phenomenal, we making love methodical We keep it democratic so that every voice is audible Peace that keep me radical is keeping me responsible Liberating everywhere till ain't nobody bombable And if they come to kill us then we'll liberate the hospital Imagine having no fear, welcome to the possible People got the power and the power is Students stand up, this is Freedom University We march in the streets and there ain't no tuition We learn from our people who are living up in prison And free with our vision Tell me how you living, are you free in New York? Are you free in the Shah? Let me hear the people say free, free Palestine Say free, free Palestine and now is the moment, this is the time Liberating everywhere so everyone can shine No mas, here we go No mas, no more Try the hills of Salvador And for the mountains of Virginia We cry out, no mas, no more No mas, no more We will stop these dirty wars Compañeros, compañeros We cry out No mas, no more Let's go, y'all. You can go ahead and stand up. We're going to close it out like we mean it. Come on. Here we go. This is how we promise, right? I need uh, everybody in this space to take this moment as an opportunity to just go ahead and give that nod of gratitude to the people next to you, especially those who brought you out here. Because the people that bring us into justice work are our comrades. <clears throat> Let me hear y'all say, we appreciate you. Say we love you. Say we are together. Say hasta la victoria. All right, let's do it like we mean it. Here we go. Let's sing. No mas, no more. Shout the hills of Salvador. And for the mountains of Virginia, we cry out no mas, no more. Cantalo. No mas, no more. We will stop these dirty wars. Compañeros, compañeros, we cry out. No mas, no more. One more. Yo, he set us up for hatred, taking men and making vagrants so flagrant that my neighbor needs a flag to prove his favor to this nation that's disgracing all the people who are facing time in jail for immigration. I'm losing my patience, cause Haitians only leaving cause the U.S. keeps deceiving our people to believe in that elections make them even like democracy was even close to being what they seeing. In reality, they fleeing from these cities without pity. They fit into a system that just kicks them and depicts them as unworthy. The truth is they would gladly go back if these U.S. Corporations didn't wage an attack, taking land that ain't complaints to have their women use their hands to be exposed to, and the dignity is costless. 
Don't forget they come across, y'all, from countries paying debt for social services that Americans give their pets. You know what? Listen, y'all. Place your bets on immigration, raising up this population from Latinos to the Asians. It's time that we be changing. Who got the power in their hands? Now's the hour to demand. The ones who work the land be the ones who make the plan. Make some noise for yourself. No more. No more. Shot the hills of Salvador. Echo the mountains of Virginia. We cry out. No more. No more. No more. No more, we must stop these dirty wars. Compañeras, compañero, we cry out. No más, no more. No más, no more. No más, no more. Gracias a todos. Bendiciones. Eso. I want to do that. <laughs> Our celebration, the Eucharist, follows. And folks who did the workshop with me on uh, culture work, please come to the front. The folks that did the workshop. All right. See you all for the mass. 445 for choir practice for the. IFTJ Tabernacle Choir. <laughs>